Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures Daily Dose of Nature. Today's topic, bird photography pro tips, presented by NatHab Expedition Leader Aditya Panda. I'm your host, Rob Mess. Thank you all so much for joining us here today. Over to you, Aditya. Thank you, Rob. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another uh, NatHab Daily Dose of Nature webinar. Um, on the 3rd of July, um, I had presented a similar webinar uh, on uh, the basics of bird photography, and uh, I'm sure a lot of you attended that one. Uh, this one today is, in a way, a sequel to that. Um, the webinar uh, on the 3rd of July had uh, discussed, you know, the, the rudimentaries of bird photography. We are going to recap that in a bit. Uh, but today's webinar is meant more for the advanced amateur and the pros. And uh, the purpose of today's webinar is to help you take your bird photography to the next level uh, after having learned the basics and uh, to help you help to help your pictures stand out. Um, for those of you who haven't attended my webinars in the past or haven't traveled with me on that have expeditions. Uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Aditya Panda, and I have been leading NatHab expeditions in India since 2016. I primarily lead the, uh, as, as we call them, the Tiger Trips of India, the Grand India Wildlife Adventure, India Tiger Quest, and India Tiger Safari, which is Photo Pro expedition. Um, when I'm not leading these trips, I work in a state called Orissa, which is where I'm from, and I work in conservation of tiger and elephant landscapes in that part of India, which is the eastern part of India. So, without further ado, let's get into the pro tips of bird photography. But before that, let's do a quick recap of what we discussed on bird photography basics, equipment settings and techniques, which is what I had uh, presented on the 3rd of July and which you can find on that Hab's website as well as YouTube channel and you know you can watch the recording of it. So on that webinar we had discussed primarily you know how to find birds, how to approach birds, and how to get birds to come closer to you. We have also discussed uh, the basics of uh, equipment, you know, what kind of equipment to use and what to look for in the equipment you want to invest in for your bird photography. Um, we also discussed the basics of uh, camera settings and some shooting techniques. And we had also uh, talked about the ethics of bird watching and bird photography, which are very, very important and foundational to everything we do with wildlife in general. Now, those of you who have traveled on NatHab expeditions and spent time and interacted with uh, expedition leaders like myself and my colleagues know that there is nothing we like to do more than to make a plan. No matter you know, how a trip is going, no matter what unexpected things might or might not happen on an adventure, we always have a plan and we love to make those plans. As a bird photographer or a wildlife photographer in general, who wants to take their photography to the next level, who wants to go beyond just you know, getting documenting shots of uh, several bird species one thing that you need to do uh, and where indeed you need to start uh, to start taking your uh, to start taking your craft to the next level is to plan to make a really good plan uh, and uh, every time you go out into the field you must go with a plan in mind and that way you are going to be rewarded a lot more than if you just landed up at a bird watching site uh, with you know no no mission no goal in mind and uh, just to enjoy bird photography 
sure you'll get a lot of birds but if you plan your trip properly if you plan your uh, shoot properly you are going to get rewarded really really well one of the first things to do um, when planning uh, your approach to bird photography is to have a regular site a regular spot uh, where you can go again and again and uh, you know land up there with your camera and shoot um, you know for full days or several days in a row and uh, you know consistency really pays once you start uh, visiting a spot regularly even if it might not have uh, you know very exciting birds even if it's your local park or some spot close to where you live with very ordinary birds that you see regularly around your home maybe uh, and and not much else even then it really really pays to go regularly to a spot and photograph there what happens is that over time you get to know that spot that location in and out you know where the best perches are you know where the best um, foraging grounds for birds are you get to know of course what kind of birds you find there you also get to find their roosting spots you find their nesting spots you find the spots where they like to drink water you find the spots where certain kinds of birds um, like to have dust baths and uh, you understand you really get to understand the light in that area you understand which part of the uh, location has the best light in the morning which part of the location has the best uh, light in you know around around sunset so consistency and diligence really really pay so do um, you know find and regularly visit a good birding spot and you will be rewarded with some really really good pictures and every time you visit every time you go out birding be it to your regular birding spot or be it on an expedition to you know a national park or even overseas uh, and this applies Almost everything that I tell you today will apply both to bird photography uh, and wildlife photography in general. So every time you go on a trip, try and go with a purpose, with goals in mind. Um, say to photograph a certain kind of bird at a certain time of the day at a certain spot. Um, of course, if you're going uh, on a Trip to a place you've never been before, then the best you can probably do is to have, uh, you know, a species list um, that you might want to check off uh, on that trip. But in your regular birding spots, you can actually plan things very, very meticulously. You, you can know where the local owls like to roost, for example, um, or or uh, where, uh, you know which directions the local flocks of starlings fly in. Um, so you can really plan very meticulously, uh, very particular shots that you might want to go, go out seeking on a certain day. And you can actually afford to go get that shot and come back and not be distracted by much else. So plan in advance and plan uh, a purpose, a goal, for every day that you go out. The one thing that sets apart the pros from the amateurs or the advanced amateurs from the beginners is that the pros really uh, like to go you know, the whole way. They have, uh, they, they, they are more than willing to get down and dirty in the mud, to lie down and approach a bird, you know, uh, crawling on the ground, they are more than happy to go out when it is still dark before sunrise and be there at a particular spot before the sun rises, waiting in advance for action to happen. You know, go out, set up a hide, spend six hours or eight hours 
sitting inside it and see how uh, beautifully you'll be rewarded with birds uh, uh, coming really, really close and uh, uh, you know offering you some amazing sightings, some amazing behavior because they have no idea you're there. So sacrifice more, uh, you know, put in some effort, go out early, stay out longer, and that really, really helps. Some of you might be wondering at this moment that uh, I, um, you know, this webinar was all about pro tips, and uh, you might be expecting uh, me to talk about uh, camera settings and things like that. Of course, I'll talk about that, but that you know, no amount of gear, no amount of settings can help you get great pictures uh, if you don't look at these. Uh, if, if if you don't keep these basics uh, in mind, these basic rules uh, that really help you find awesome subjects in the most ordinary uh, habitats. You can never be a good bird photographer without being a good bird watcher. A good bird watcher understands birds. Uh, a, good, a good bird watcher can predict bird behavior. A good bird watcher knows what's going on around him or her or you know in, in the area that they're visiting. So it really pays to study and understand birds a bit. Uh, invest as much time as you can in books, in videos, um, in documentaries, and of course, in direct field, uh, field work, in direct field bird watching, and try and study bird ecology, the feeding habits of birds, uh, their courtship and uh, mating behavior, their nesting behavior, uh, their migration patterns, all of these can help you find unique ways and unique things to shoot, um, even in the most ordinary of birds. We can't always afford to go to amazing places and the best bird watching sites, but we can definitely afford to spend time birding in our own neighborhoods. And, uh, you know, while it always pays to learn as much as possible about birds of the world, but there's a great, um, you know, convenience and opportunity to really master the birds in your local area. Learn as much as you can about them and absolutely master their behavior, their habits, their feeding patterns, all of those things I talked about in the previous slide. And um, even their local habits, you know, uh, Birds in different areas behave uh, differently based on their local habitat, the availability of water, the um, uh, you know uh, the, the local climate, all of that. You need to master all of these things in your local area, especially that spot that I told you that you really need to find and visit regularly, a uh, spot or number of spots, uh, whatever you choose. And that is really, really going to pay. Now, now let's talk about settings. There's no two ways about it. If you take your photography seriously, if you want to create images that really stand out, if you want images that can be printed large, if you want images that really match up with that of the pros and images that do not look routine. You must shoot in the raw format. Um, every camera, every DSLR or mirrorless camera or any camera that takes itself seriously, including iPhones these days, all have a raw file format option. Um, usually the pictures that you see online, the pictures that you're seeing on my screen, uh, or the pictures that you post on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter or wherever, they are in a format called the JPEG format. Now, the JPEG format is a compressed format, um, and many cameras, uh, in fact, all cameras have the option of shooting 
in the JPEG format. Uh, but what they do then is that they, uh, when, when you're shooting in JPEG, you are letting the camera decide what your picture looks best as. You know, the camera decides the contrast, the brightness, the color saturation, the sharpness, all of that uh, using, you know, machine learned uh, algorithms. And uh, your camera then decides to do all of that to your picture. Then it compresses your picture in file size. And uh, you end up with a, uh, with a decent looking picture, but not an extraordinary picture. You end up with a picture that you cannot then do much with because all of the original uh, shooting data, all of the uh, raw data, as we call it, that uh, your camera must have originally captured is now lost. So it always helps to shoot in the raw format. That way you get a much larger file, but that file has so much information in it that you can then come back home, sit um, on your computer and start uh, really fine tuning that picture to its best uh, potential and to look exactly the way you want it to look. Uh, for comparison, let's just say that a raw file is like a slide film or a negative that you can work on in a dark room and get the best out of in print, while a JPEG is already a postcard sized print that you then cannot do much with. Right. I hope that uh, clarifies the, um, the difference between RAW and JPEG. Now I shot this picture uh, in the RAW format. Uh, I deliberately underexposed it because I wanted the bird uh, in focus. And later I could get all the detail out uh, from the background when I uh, worked on it. Um, and, and that is the beauty of the RAW format. Now let's talk about settings of um, exposure, you know, your camera settings, how uh, you need to set your camera. Now you'll have photographers telling you all kinds of things. They'll tell you uh, that aperture priority is the best. And then there are those who believe that the pros only shoot manual and nothing else. If you don't shoot manual, you're not a pro. And uh, of course, you will have heard me telling you in some of the basic photography uh, webinars to shoot even in the auto mode or uh, when shooting wildlife to shoot in the uh, sport mode or things like that. But uh, once you decide to become an advanced amateur or a pro, you have to go beyond auto. And uh, you really have to uh, decide which mode works best for you. Don't listen to all those people who say aperture is the best and nothing else works or manual is only what you should be shooting and nothing else works. That's not how it is. They all have their own pros and cons and uh, their own uh, unique advantages and disadvantages. Uh, personally, I have always shot uh, in the aperture priority mode 95% of the time. Uh, sometimes I might go to manual in, in, in special circumstances, but I have almost always personally shot with aperture, but then that works for me. It might or might not work for you or your style of shooting, right? So one of the modes that uh, seems to be really popular these days and which uh, does work pretty well is to shoot in manual mode, but with ISO set to auto, right? So you set the uh, shutter speed and the aperture for every single shot and the camera then decides to expose it correctly by setting the right ISO. So you leave that to the camera and you focus on uh, shutter speed and aperture, which are the two most important things of uh, exposure and uh, of, of getting exactly what you want from your picture. Fair enough, that works well. You could try that, experiment with that, see if it works for you. If it doesn't, try something else. Uh, 
uh, aperture priority I think is the easiest. Um, you only decide the aperture. Um, sometimes uh, if you so choose to, you can choose to set the ISO as well. I choose um, aperture priority and I leave the ISO in automatic. So the camera chooses, uh, uh, you know, an, an ISO uh, that, uh, that, that suits a particular minimum shutter speed that I've already fed into the camera by going into the settings, by going into the menu. So um, I decide the aperture and uh, then the camera decides the shutter speed according to that, uh, according to that and the ISO. So when you choose auto ISO, you can also um, dial in a minimum shutter speed that the camera will try not to go below. So I usually leave my uh, shutter speed preference at one one thousandth of a second. And uh, I set my auto ISO range till about ISO 12,800 or so. So in situations where the light is simply not enough and uh, you know uh, there's no way to go above ISO 12,800 because I've asked the camera not to go above ISO 12,800, the camera will end up choosing a shutter speed that is slower than one one thousandth of a second. But in 99% of the situations, the camera will give me a shutter speed of whatever I have desired or higher and set an ISO accordingly. I prefer aperture priority because I like my wildlife photos most of the time uh, to have a very shallow depth of field. I want to focus on the subject and I want the background and the foreground blurred out. That is something I enjoy and I like. But in certain situations, I might also use a narrower aperture. Uh, for example, when I'm shooting birds in flight or maybe a flock of birds. So aperture priority works for me. Then of course, there is full manual mode where you set the shutter speed, you set the ISO, you set the aperture. It is definitely uh, a more involving form of photography. Um, also a much more challenging form of photography, one where uh, the chances of getting things wrong are much higher. And, uh, you know, one that frankly works much better in a studio than out in the field. That is my personal opinion. There are also those who prefer to set the camera on shutter priority mode. Shutter priority lets you decide the shutter speed and then the camera adjusts the aperture accordingly. And, uh, you know, a lot of people when shooting wildlife prefer to use shutter priority because um, they are um, concerned that if their shutter speed falls too much, then they'll get blurred pictures, which is correct. But uh, uh, there are other ways of doing that. I personally prefer some control over the aperture when shooting wildlife because it can make a lot of difference to how your subject is perceived, uh, uh, you know, based on the depth of field. Uh, and depth of field, as you must be knowing, is dictated almost entirely by the aperture. Uh, besides, of course, the focal length of your lens and the distance of your subject from the camera. Now, that was about uh, how to set your uh, uh, exposure settings. Now, let's talk about how to set up your autofocus and your frame rate. Um, wildlife moves, you know, animals move, birds move, they're moving around all the time. Um, it's very difficult to maintain focus on them for that reason because they're moving around. So, most cameras will have uh, at least two autofocus modes. One is called autofocus S or AFS, which means single shot. The other is called AFC or autofocus continuous, which means continuous focus shots. Um, for those of you who use Canon cameras, uh, the word for ca uh, Canon, uh, the word for AFC in Canon is AF servo. Um, AFC 
will help you continuously keep your moving subject in focus. So that is what I would strongly recommend for uh, uh, your autofocus setting. And um, every camera has a maximum frame rate, you know, uh, number, a certain number of pictures that it can shoot per second. And I would suggest that with wildlife and birds, you should always set your camera to its maximum possible frame rate potential. That way you get a lot more pictures of your moving subject. Uh, your chances of finding uh, unique action or a bit of catch light in the eye um, or uh, you know things like that are much higher. Also in situations where light is low and your shutter speed is slower um, or just you know, in any situation where your subject is moving, your chances of finding a sharp photo also become much higher. Now, um, so we covered exposure, we covered uh, autofocus and frame rates. Now let's talk about metering quickly. Um, you know, cameras are uh, fitted with an inbuilt meter, a light meter, an exposure meter that analyzes the frame and suggests the best exposure settings, the best uh, shutter speed, uh, aperture, and ISO combination, right? So what a camera will do uh, when it sees a scene is that uh, it will take up, uh, it, it, it will measure the lights, the shadows, and uh, arrive at an average uh, figure, an average exposure figure, and uh, feed you that average, right? Your uh, camera will suggest those, uh, unless if you're in manual mode, your camera is going to suggest some shutter speed setting or ISO setting or aperture setting. Now, when you choose the matrix metering mode, this is called metering, right? And cameras have three basic kinds of metering modes. Some might have more, but there are three basic kinds. Um, number one is matrix uh, metering, which uh, you know where the camera measures the light across the entire range of the frame uh, and works out an average and gives you an average. That works great for landscapes, but it doesn't work great for birds or. Uh, there is also something called center weighted metering, which is similar to matrix, but here the camera, instead of measuring the entire frame, will measure just around the center of the frame, right? That's sort of a neither here nor there kind of uh, measure, which I've never really found useful. What you want to use with wildlife most of the time and birds is spot metering. In spot metering, um, you know, the, the camera will um, meter only what is there in the very center of your frame, covered by that little dot in the center of your frame, frame the, the central autofocus point. Uh, we'll discuss autofocus points later. The central autofocus point and give you a reading for that. It ignores what the sky is like. It ignores what the peripheral light, the lighting is like it will only uh, meter the area of your autofocus point and give you a reading for that. Um, with wildlife and birds, that is what you want to do because your autofocus point might be on the face of an animal or a bird, uh, which is lit differently than the rest of the picture. So you really want your focus and attention on the animal's eye, on the animal's face. Uh, and uh, spot metering helps you get that. It will meter, uh, in, in most cases, the center of the frame. In some cameras, the spot metering can be moved around with whichever autofocus point you, you are choosing to use. Um, and it will meter that. And that way, you get an accurate reading for your subject rather than losing it in an average evaluation of the whole frame. Now, having understood and discussed metering, let's now move to autofocus points. Um, 
which autofocus points to use. It can be really confusing. Uh, cameras offer so many options. My own camera, I use Nikon, offers um, 3D autofocus and multi-point autofocus and single-point autofocus and whatnot. Um, and the mirrorless cameras these days, they all offer uh, bird eye autofocus and animal eye autofocus and airplane autofocus and car autofocus. So uh, the autofocus points uh, that you really want to use on uh, birds and wildlife is ideally, especially with subjects that are not moving around really fast, you want to use an autofocus point that is a single point autofocus point. And usually with your camera's arrow keys or joystick, you can move that point around the screen. And where you want that point, like you can see in the lower image on this slide, is on your subject's eye. If you use um, 3D autofocus or multi-point autofocus, your camera will start to look for the part of the image that has the most contrast to focus on. And sometimes that might just be a duck's butt, but that's not what you want. You want the focus to be on the duck's eye. And uh, that is why you must use your uh, single point autofocus in most cases. But for example, what you do in a situation where uh, action is just happening way too fast for you to be able to move your autofocus point around. For example, in, in, in birds in flight. In birds in flight, you have, in most cases at least, a clean background, which is usually the sky, or it could be the ocean, or, you know, flying birds usually offer a clean background, especially if you're panning with your camera following the bird in it. And in those cases, the 3D autofocus or multi-point autofocus might work well. Uh, because they usually uh, manage to nail focus on the bird's face. Um, but nothing really beats the bird eye autofocus that the modern mirrorless, the latest mirrorless cameras offer. So if you have those, just use those. Another uh, pro tip for using uh, your DSLR or mirrorless camera is to learn how to use the back button autofocus button. Uh, back button AF is really, really useful. Uh, and once you make a habit of it, you, you will never go back to using regular AF. You know, most cameras are, uh, the, the factory settings are set to trigger autofocus when you uh, press down on the shutter button, right? When you half press your shutter button, you hear your lens doing its work, focusing. And then when you uh, press down completely on the shutter button, it takes a picture. The problem with that is, say, for example, I have a beautiful kingfisher perched on a nice perch. Um, and uh, I'm using my um, center autofocus point, um, and I half press, half press my shutter uh, button to focus on the eye of the kingfisher. Now I'm using the center autofocus point, which is the most powerful autofocus point and the most accurate one. And I'm also using spot uh, metering. So I'm using my center autofocus point. And uh, I have focused on the bird. And uh, I have two choices. Either I have to keep the bird in the center of my frame and get a picture, which is not great because uh, that would not be a very pleasant composition. You would ideally want to place the bird in one of the rule of the thirds lines. You know, think about positive space, and negative space, positive space in front of the bird, and cut down on negative space behind the bird, and compose it a certain way. Uh, but I can't do that because if I move my camera, my autofocus point will also move, and I will lose autofocus. So what I would do there is I would go into my camera settings, disable shutter uh, release autofocus, and enable only back button autofocus. So what happens is I have a different button for autofocus, and my shutter button 
just does the job of taking the picture. So what I can do is use my back button on the focus to gain focus, then move my camera to get the composition I want, leave my back button and press the shutter uh, button. And you know that way the camera will retain auto focus on the subject. I'll get the composition I want and I get the picture I want. Of course, that might not work with birds that are moving around really quickly. Um, but even then you have nothing to lose because even when your bird is moving really quickly, you can still maintain continuous autofocus on it by using your back button. So those were some of the basic um, uh, you know, settings to keep in mind and uh, play around with and learn and master. And you know, there's nothing really that can replace practice. You know, as they say, practice makes perfect. And uh, you can try all of these settings that I just told you about. Go out, practice on your dogs, practice on your cats, practice on your garden birds, practice on anything. And, you know, get a hang of it. Uh, understand what works best for what situation. And, uh, you know, that way you will really be able to master those settings and you will really know what works where. So for example, your settings for a bird perched might be different for, from the settings for a bird in flight, uh, might be different from the settings for birds in flocks. So once you master these techniques and settings and uh, you develop a muscle memory of your camera's dials and buttons, then you can quickly change them around, play around with those settings with changing situations and changing subjects. So practice, 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 experiment, practice, repeat. Uh, another thing that you can try slightly later is that, uh, you know, most of the time you'll be shooting at a very high shutter speed. And to enable that high shutter speed, you will also have a reasonably high ISO. Um, once you have started to gain confidence, um, you can try to progressively reduce your ISO and your shutter speed, especially after you've got a few safety shots, as I call them, you know, initial shots, just to make sure that you have some keepers before you can begin experimenting. Uh, progressively lower your ISO, and uh, if needed, even lower your shutter speed, and you will get some really, really high quality images if you get some keepers. Um, with practice, you will start to get more keepers. With practice, your, uh, your arms, your fingers, your chest will all develop the muscle memory required to hold your camera really, really still um, when shooting in lower than usual shutter speeds. And uh, that is something that I've always found really rewarding. Practice holding your camera, practice holding your lens, and panning. You know, with birds, they're always moving. Um, they might be moving along the ground, foraging, or they might be in flight and they might be moving. Practice holding your camera to your, um, to your, to your face and uh, look through the viewfinder and follow moving subjects. When you, uh, when you, when you do that, you need to learn and uh, sort of um, master these habits of holding your arms really close to your chest, trailing your camera really well, using your face also to support your camera and minimizing shape, and at the same time, learning how to pan. When you pan, don't just move your head, move your entire body. That really helps with stability and control. Another thing that pros usually do is that they anticipate uh, a bird to appear somewhere, or um, you know they they anticipate a perch, or like in the case of this dab chick or little grief. I was anticipating where you know these these little grebes they go underwater to fish and then pop up 
had a different spot from where they went in. Now, uh, by generally following the direction in which it seemed to be swimming, I was waiting for it to pop up somewhere in my frame. But um, what I had done already was manually, I had pre-focused in, in the general area where I was expecting it to be, so that uh, when I pressed my autofocus button, my camera did not have to do a lot of hunting. My lens didn't have to do a lot of hunting. So pre-focus, um, this works in the case of larger animals too. This works in the case of all kinds of wildlife photography. Try and anticipate where your subject will be and pre-focus there. Don't wait for, because you, know, you never know why you're holding your camera in your lap or you know, maybe uh, just walking with it. Uh, the auto the, the focus point might have changed complete, completely. Uh, you might have been photographing something very close uh, at one point of time, and then the next moment you need to photograph a bird uh, 30 or 40 meters away. And uh, then your camera has to, your lens has to go all the way from minimum focal distance to infinity and then hunt and find where your subject is before it locks focus. So pre-focus manually, and that will quicken that whole process a lot. And if you understand your birds well, if you study your birds well, if you watch your birds enough, you will be able to anticipate action. You will be able to tell when a bird is about to take off. You will be able to tell, um, you know, uh, what a bird is going to do next and be ready to shoot that when it happens. Uh, another thing that I always tell my guests, especially on my trips here in India, when we are on safari looking for animals and birds, um, you see, um, for us as guides uh, and our uh, game drive drivers and spotters, our eyes are trained to pick uh, animals and birds you know, without the aid of any uh, optics. So even when we're just driving around, we will pick up um, animals or birds at a distance or, or in thick cover and be able to point it out to our guests. Um, sometimes what my guests do is, even before they know where the animal is, uh, just by knowing the general direction of it, they'll start searching for it with their binoculars, okay? That is not a great way to find things. You see, if you don't have a general idea where to look, um, you know, you're, you're not, not going to be able to find your subject with your telephoto lens or your binoculars, right? You need to know where exactly to point your lens or your binoculars at to be able to see your subject because binoculars and telephoto lenses have a very narrow field of view, right? You don't know where to look as it is. Now, if you further narrow that field of view by searching for your subject through your tele lens, you're never going to find it. Or you might just find it by look, but chances are you're never going to find it. Always try and get uh, a sighting, a first sighting with your naked eyes before pointing your long lens or your binoculars towards the bird. Um, some artistic tips. Um, try and get land backgrounds. Um, I should have ideally used a picture of a bird in flight with a land background in this picture, in this slide, instead of this one. This is the first bird. Um, try using, uh, try to get a bird with a flying bird, especially with a land uh, based background rather than just, you know, the bare sky, the empty sky. Empty skies are boring blue. Land backgrounds have uh, a lot of texture, a lot of colors, and make for much more interesting backgrounds. And I keep saying this in every photography webinar that I do, get down to eye level. Of course, this is a duck, which is why I have to get down to eye level. If um, it's a bird on a branch, try and get up to eye level. Eye level really, really uh, helps engage the subject with the viewer, right? 
when you are looking at something at eye level, you are looking at it as another person, as, uh, you know, it, it gives you a very different perspective. It gives you a very engaging uh, perspective. So try and get to eye level every time you can. It also gives you much more smooth uh, backgrounds, which are called bouquets. Uh, so try and do that. And uh, it's going to make your picture stand out uh, versus, you know, the regular pictures of shooting down or shooting up at birds. You don't necessarily always have to fill the frame. Um, this is also something that I keep saying. Add the environment. Add what it looks like to have the bird in that environment it is in. Also add what it feels like to be present in that moment, uh, in that light, to be seeing that sight of your birds with uh, whatever environment they're in. Uh, just close, uh, tight portraits all the time can be boring. Um, and as I was saying, uh, if you com combine all of that um, and try and get uh, some uh, life into your pictures, they are going to really engage with the audience. Uh, one of the best ways to engaging, to, to, to making a subject, a wildlife subject or a bird subject come to life in a picture is to try and get some catch light in the eye. It really makes the eye pop up and it really draws attention to it and really looks good. Um, also, uh, you know, they say, if the eye is in focus, everything else is in focus enough. So try, at lower shutter speeds, uh, especially when birds are flying uh, or moving, to try and get some, you know, while, while keeping the eye sharp and in focus, try and get some motion blur in the wings or in the background so that it, it, it shows how the animal or bird is moving. It shows, um, uh, you know, motion in a still picture that those pictures are really really engaging um, of course they take a lot of trial and error uh, and there are more errors than there are successes but practice that it really is worth it um, also very important if you want your pictures to uh, come up to pro level you cannot ignore sharpness sharpness is critically important um, you know, prime lenses are usually sharper than zoom lenses, although you do get some really good zoom lenses these days. Um, I myself use a zoom lens that works really well. It's really sharp. Um, teleconverters do help with additional reach, but they do cut down on sharpness, so try and avoid using them. If you must use them, use them on a prime lens. Um, lenses can be fine-tuned with your camera body. Uh, take it to the lens shop or you can try doing this yourself. There are many YouTube videos on how to do it. Fine tune your lenses autofocus. Make sure that your lens is focusing exactly where, when, you, when, you, when it locks focus, it should be focusing exactly where you want it to focus rather than five millimeters before or behind the place where it should uh, focus. And this, can, this is something that can be easily done in your own camera. Um, most lenses have their peak sharpness. Uh, a couple of aperture stops down what their maximum aperture usually is. And this is especially true for zoom lenses. Now, while I have personally always been an advocate of using as wide an aperture as possible to get as smooth a background as possible, um, if you're using a teleconverter or if you're, or if you're using a zoom lens that doesn't produce stellar sharp images wide open. Try and stop down a couple of um, points. Uh, if your lens, for example, is capable of f6.3 uh, at its long end, uh, try shooting at f8. Uh, you will get optically superior images. Always invest in a really good tripod, right? That is really, really crucial to getting sharp pictures. But just uh, using a tripod in itself is not enough. 
um, you can stabilize your lens even while it's mounted on this tripod by placing your hand on it or hanging the weight below your tripod. Um, in addition, uh, if you're hand holding your lens, uh, do use the lens stabilization functions that exist in many cameras uh, and all, almost all lenses these days. Um, one thing that uh, can still give you uh, blurry images despite everything else being right on your end is heat haze. Uh, heat haze, especially at distance, uh, can ruin your pictures. Uh, you can try all you want and you'll not get sharp pictures. Uh, just wait for the day to cool down and go back to shooting them. Uh, there's very little that you can do with heat haze, except perhaps go closer to your subject. And very importantly, learn to post, post process. Uh, if you shoot raw, to get the best out of your picture, you must post process it. And you must post process it with uh, your own personal touch. So it's best to learn post processing and do it yourself. And I've had many webinars presented on post processing. Do look them up on Natab's website or YouTube channel. And one of the best ways to improve uh, your photography skills with birds or wildlife through the pro level is to join us on our photo pro departures. These trips are really aimed at improving you as uh, superior photographers and giving you the time uh, and guidance to practice and sharpen your photography skills to a much higher level than you started. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Rob, I would uh, love to hear all the questions that I'm sure are waiting for me. All right, thank you so much. Now, I would like to remind everyone that you can submit your questions via your question field in the control panel. All right, let's get to some of those questions. Uh, do you find spot metering can be a problem with birds in flight? Um, it can sometimes, um, but I still use it. You see, I have uh, personally managed to train my right thumb to really be able to move around the single shot uh, autofocus points quickly. Um, um, but I, uh, you know, I leave my camera on spot metering almost all the time. Um, it, it does uh, cause problems sometimes, but you see cameras these days produce pictures with such high uh, dynamic range that a little bit uh, of uh, exposure being off can easily be recovered in post-processing. Great, thank you for that. So on the Olympus and on the Nikon Z9, does the back button focus also trigger the pro capture mode? I haven't actually uh, had a chance to lay my hands on a Z9. See some of my views then, but I haven't really had a chance to play that. Uh, play them really. So I really need to look that up. Great, no problem. So, do you have any tips for shooting birds and trees at dawn when there are like low clouds and it's overcast? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, at dawn, of course, um, you have. Um, um, uh, in trees, uh, at such a time, you would want to overexpose your picture a little bit. Uh, of course, use a single point, uh, a single uh, autofocus point, so that you nail your focus through all the leaves and branches. And overexpose your picture by a stop or two, so that uh, you know uh, you get the exposure right. Otherwise, your camera is going to underexpose the picture. Uh, if the subject is in the shade. Um, and the same really applies to birds in overcast conditions as well. Overcast conditions um, um, are actually conditions I like because light is mostly muted and there are no harsh shadows and highlights. But uh, for those of you, uh, you know, this question reminds me, for those of you who are interested to learn about shooting in overcast and dark conditions on the 20th, my next webinar is exactly on that subject, so do sign up for that one. 
Is there a particular SD card that you recommend? The fastest you can find in the market. All right, that's a good answer. Um, so can you talk about what skills and equipment would be necessary for me to go on a pro photo tour as an amateur? You don't need any skills. Um, of course, uh, basic understanding of uh, your camera is useful, but um, our expedition leaders, our pro photo expedition leaders are awesome. They are really good uh, at hand holding and teaching and guiding. Um, so uh, don't be intimidated if your skills are basic or uh, even lower than basic, uh, come on these trips and uh, we'll take you to the next level. All right, great. So if you are in servo auto autofocus and you're, you're using a center point, if you move the camera, are you going to change the focus point? That depends. Um, if the subject is far enough, uh, you know, I would rather keep it in the center because I know that invariably I have to drop it. If the subject is closer uh, and filling up the frame and I have the uh, luxury to not need to drop it, then I will move the um, uh, autofocus point onto the animal's eye. Great, thank you for answering that. So I have one more question. Uh, in the slide one, the plan in advance slide, uh, one of our guests would like to know what bird you showed there. Uh, the, which slide that is? This, these are white-throated kingfishers. Great, thank you. Uh, so how, how does servo, auto, and back focus work hand in hand? Handheld, would you say? Well, how, how does the servo auto and the back focus work together? They work really well. I mean, um, the back button, the back, back auto focus button basically replaces what your shutter button have been doing so far. So if you keep it continuously pressed uh, while keeping your subject in the frame, the uh, servo auto focus is going to continue working. Great. Thanks for addressing that. Unfortunately, that's going to be the last question that we do have time for today. So I'm going to throw it back to you for your closing comments. Thank you, Rob, and thank you, everyone. Um, I hope you found this webinar useful. I hope you learned some uh, tricks that you can put into practice. And uh, there's nothing better than the satisfaction of having uh, helped somebody improve their enjoyment with their camera and wildlife. Thank you for attending. I look forward to seeing you on the next one on the 28th. And thank you so much for taking the time to present for us today. I'd also like to thank everyone who tuned in today. Now, if you're interested in information on how you can travel with NatHab, please give us a call at the number on your screen, or you can send us an email at info at nathab.com. Our adventure specialists are happy to help you out. Join us tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links on our website at nathab.com slash webinars. We did record today's presentation, and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I will conclude the webinar. Goodbye, everybody. We will see you next time.